Oh, All right, Tiger. Florida Wildcats. It's too wild for me, man. Bro. Bro. How are you going to show up with, like, the sequin shirt, though? <laughs> Yo, you got to let them know, okay? With oh, Tigers. Oh, my good Sigmund. What, who, who was the... Uh... Who was the dude who did the Tiger shows and not Tiger King? Is it Sigmund and Freud? Oh, I thought, but that's like the psychologist, isn't it? Oh, goodness. Siegfried and Roy. Uh, Sigmund and Sigmund Freud was a uh, psychologist, like a famous psychologist, like Freudian slip is named after him. Hmm. Um, Siegfried and Roy <laughs> is a very similar sounding uh, tiger based act, or at least they're best known for the use of white lions and white tigers. Check, 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 check. Cool. Ow. <laughs> Camera, what are you doing though? You gotta be over Would you here. Call me? Musicians call me that since and kindergarten. entertainers who perform Camera. together as Siegfried and Roy. Mad. Making me real mad, man. It's making me real mad. Getting quite upset over you. The problem is, is that your camera is focused on your tiger <laughs> and not on your face. Grr. I wish I was joking. <laughs> but it's like, this is clearly the more important face this, in this, this is shot. Right here. This one's shiny. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to get my, my, um, <laughs> my other camera up. And running, but it's not registering in Discord for some darn. Sure, Discord. Sure. Oh, there he goes. There you go. There you go. There you go. Uh, now where you at? Where you at? It's not even on the call anymore. Somehow that still translates to you and me in real spots, and Craig half taking up. Your spot. Craig, get out of my spot, man. We gotta talk <laughs> Quit about blowing this. up my spot, Craig. I ain't all about this. Siegfried Fischbacher and Roy Horn. And they didn't <laughs> go with the name Fischbacher and Horn. They went with Siegfried and Roy. Did Roy Horn ever evolve into Roy Don? Bruh. <laughs> <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> That's the first thing I thought of when I heard that name. <laughs> Roy Horn. <laughs> Rhyhorn? What? Oh, no. Welcome to A4 No B for Yes, the Zelda theme cod Codcast. Yeah, we're, we're all about fishing now, actually. We're going out on the boat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to A4 No B for Yes, the Zelda theme podcast. It's currently deep diving into Breath of the Wild towards the end of the game. The last episode I was absent from, and we ended up talking, well, they ended up talking about. Urbosa and Rivali's part of the Champions Ballad DLC, as well as the majority of Cass's quest leading up to the end, which we might be touching on today. My name is Cameron Hagee. I'm wearing a Luffy One Piece Second Gear shirt, and these are my co-hosts. I'm Ryan Fonzi, and I'm an espresso percolator. Mmm, drink to that. Sure. Okay. And I'm Anthony. And I'm Sparkly! <laughs> That's true. There we go. Vum, 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 Anthony, vum, the vum, aggressive vum. Care Bear. He gonna get you. Uh, my tiger PTSD. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> a warning sign. If anyone's scared of ti tigers before the <laughs> Tr episode, tr so trigger so warning so. after the fact. <laughs> 
Oopsies. Whoops. Oh, yeah. All right. So, as we were saying, we have a lot to cover today, guys. We got like a million things. Um, mm. So, we can jump right into it. I don't think we need any further ado here. Uh, we are in the middle of the DLC, and our next champion that we're going to be going to visit is our man Daruk. I want to start with Daruk. Mm-hmm. We have to cover Daruk and Mifa tonight, but Daruk is, um, I got some problems <laughs> with, with Daruk and like, not that I'm annoyed with him, but I just think that the game could have done more with him. So I kind of want to get through his, his section so we can get onto the, the meteor stuff. If that makes sense. But, um, yeah, just like the previous trials. I mean, we can go through the the overview real quick for each one of these champions during the Champions Ballad DLC. Uh, we are tasked to visit a obelisk of sorts that has three locations marked out for us to go do a challenge that is meant to mirror a challenge that the champion had to overcome during their time. Uh, once we complete each one of those, we're giving a shrine, given a shrine per, uh, per location, per challenge. Uh, and once we do three of those, we are able to go back to the divine beast to take on the memory of their battle against, uh, whatever blight they were, uh, faced against back in the past. (laughs) It's not just a memory though. The truth is deeper than we ever knew. Yeah. Yeah. Don't just, don't just, uh, you know, you can't just ragdoll it, man. This is a serious <laughs> business. No, there's, there's something like, don't just dismiss it, man. As like some, yeah, this, some, <laughs> this isn't just you in know. your head. You're not just reliving a past memory. This is the truth goes deeper this, than, you know, this isn't just theater of the mind, man. You're really you living could, it. You could get ouchied in there big time. <laughs> you, you could get ouchied. <laughs> <laughs> the stakes are real, real high. <laughs> So, we go to the obelisk for Daruk. I don't even know where it is. I'm not going to try to tell you where it is. It's somewhere on the volcano. We meet, we meet Cast there, and he sings a song about these trials. The trials yeah, are does. as follows. One, defeat a giant igneo talus. It's massive. Makes the regular taluses look like baby taluses. It's very big. It's out in the lava. It's out in the lava. So, you're going to want to bring a glider. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so, like you do everywhere. <laughs> second challenge uh, is what I call the Death Mountain Descent. This is uh, another like chase the rings, go through the rings. It's a time trial. You just got to race through a series of rings that start at the top of Death Mountain and you glide your way down. You're going to want to bring a glider for that. Uh, last one is a uh, uh, a lava trial. There's just a ring out in some lava. You got to find a way to stand there and survive. Uh, there's a couple different ways to do this. One of which you could throw a block out there. And uh, if that's the case, you're going to want to bring a glider. <laughs> no. So, uh, yeah. Three trials, three amazing death defying stunts. Uh, did you guys have any particular fun and or qualms with these? As you were doing them, did you do them? It's probably my first question. <laughs> well, you see, the uh, the person on YouTube I watch do them for me because I like to vicariously play this uh, through other people. Um, <laughs> he almost took a a dip of death into the lava underneath the ring descent of doom. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, but he but he didn't. He pulled out at the last second and uh, managed to like clip the top of the ring with Link's head and save it. And I was like, Whew, man, that was close. Wow. Dang. I was on the edge of my seat. It's incredible. Exhilarating. (laughs) Anthony, (laughs) what you you got? (laughs) Well, I personally feel like these challenges at this point, I'm like, you know, Igneo Talus, really? Like, this is Master Quest, man. Like, yeah, I have five hundred thousand bomb arrows. You know, you're gonna have to throw something like I don't know, maybe 
throw in like Demise or Girahim because <laughs> I'm going to need a challenge because Enigmeo Talus is just not doing it for me at this you point. Can't, you can't even use bomb arrows, though, my what guy. The they world. explode in your face when you shoot them on the volcano. You would just be doing the lava's job for it. I have like 500,000 ice arrows. All right, I say I was a Anthony, <laughs> Anthony's just over here, like you know, I was really hoping for like a Zant or a Vati, but <laughs> all I got, got was all I got was fighting the mountain itself, man. I don't know the heart in the mountain. <laughs> no, he wasn't thing, even that good. This the Talus was too big for his own good because he couldn't move very fast. I mean, he basically was a living platform. So once you were up above him, what was he gonna do? You just land it on him, you know, you freeze him, cool him down a little bit, just do spin to win. It's what I like. He, he was quick. He Stand didn't really up. have that much more health than a regular Talus, you know. Major and Talus is one of the easiest enemies in master mode as well to keep hitting and yeah. keep knocking the health down because he doesn't move. You know, it's not like a Lionel where it's constantly moving and you yeah. got to worry about getting in there to get the health down and make sure he doesn't start regen. So. I hear that. Yeah, it was just super easy. Barely an inconvenience. <laughs> one might say. Yeah. 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 I think the lava pools, honestly, of these three is probably the hardest. And even that is not that hard. Because you 100%. just Yeah. <laughs> People don't realize. People don't realize. And also, to your point, Cameron, <laughs> um, yes, bomb arrows do explode. On contact, and yes, I did forget that fact while I was right next to the Ignotalus. So Oof. I did, I did, I did hit him. I did damage, but I also did damage to myself. Yeah, yeah. If, so you, if you so much as pull out a bomb arrow, it just goes off, man. My vicarious YouTube player also did such things. <laughs> yeah, it's, I completely forgot. I was like, "This will work." It's, it's hard when you already have bomb arrows selected. And you go yeah. into like bullet time or just try to pull out an arrow to see which one you have out and it just blows up. And you're you like, what forget. happened? It's like, oh, I was, like, set what? To, I was set to bomb. Whoops. It's yep. bad. Definitely lost some lives that way. Uh, but yeah, once we do all of this, we can get to fire. Well, ooh, before we get to fire blight, hold on. There's actually some shrines as well. Uh, after we defeat the giant Talos, we get into a shrine that uh, gets allows us to relive our glory days in the Great Lazalfos War, uh, where we get to basically use a uh, a cannon to blow through some paths, and uh, it's actually paired with uh, motion controls this time, so no. we get to <laughs> move a a block to find the holes to shoot targets through. It's See, I wouldn't cool. have been able to do that anyways because uh, those those shrine. You have to interact with them, motion control things. They don't work on the Steam Deck. Ooh. I can aim. I can aim with motion I controls with my arrows. Hacking the Steam Deck for this. Yeah, I'm running it on the Wii U emulator on my Steam Deck, and while, like I said, I can actually even move the whole camera behind the link with motion controls. So it even it technically has more usable usability for the motion controls than even the Switch version does. It does not work with interacting with actual things that require like any shrine that you go up to and mm. you click on a pedestal and it, you move something around with it completely unresponsive gotcha hmm and unlike the other ones where i would do some kind of convoluted bomb blast to get all the way over to the ending and skip the entire puzzle like how speedrunners do it where they set up two bombs jump off blow one bomb into the other into link and then give themselves a massive boost and pull out the glider to get somewhere you're not supposed to be able to get to i wouldn't have been able to do that in this one so i would have just kind of probably gotten soft locked gotcha well i mean you can always just like leave the shrines or whatever but yeah you you wouldn't be able to complete the dlc that way yeah um <clears throat> yeah so the next one if the death mountain descent bit uh there's this really cool shrine where you ride a block through like fire jets oh yeah i call this one my box is my home <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> there you go. I actually, I had a lot of fun with that shrine. I think that it's yeah. just, just really cool to just narrowly avoid fire jets and climb the block at the right time and just jump around on the walls. Like, you remember I how was I was really saying well last episode, how like probably like, what is it? Nine shrines? No, I'm sorry, six shrines. So I think it was like four or five of them. I probably like four. I was like, these are boring and they mm -hmm. feel like they're just kind of regurgitated from 
shrines in the main game, but this actually felt fun. Yeah, the con- the like conveyor. Different. Like I felt like I was in like the the Star Wars Geonosis factory from Episode Two. Like it's kind of the feeling that I got. Like I was just like narrowly dodging random saw blades, even though that wasn't really the challenge. But that's what it felt like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then from the lava pool one, uh, there's one that I have here just says blocks and flames. I think the shrine was literally called Block the Flames. It's just a lot of magnet blocks and Yeah, you gotta the first the chunk you go in there, you gotta blow up some a uh, rock at the bottom to knock the flames down, and then the second one you pull out the metal box that knocks those flames down, you gotta use that yeah. box to shield yourself or you just yeah, yeah, yeah. collect the blocks and keep it moving. So, cool visuals. I don't yeah. remember any other shrines having like a lava floor pit serviceable i mean there definitely were other ones with lava pits but it was more like Mm. if you fall you die kind of lava pit not we Mm. want you to traverse this lava lava pit okay um but yeah yeah it it, serviceable is what i would call this one it wasn't super unique or original or like special it just did what it was supposed to do be a shrine all of them were relatively easy though yeah nothing too challenging so now that we got the three emblems we can go to Fire Blight Plus, who uh, who was a chump, Dude. total chump. Fire Blight I mean, he Plus, was an original chump. He went <laughs> down just about as fast as he did the first time. Like there wasn't really anything super difficult. I mean, I don't know if it's just the right set of tools that they gave me to do the job, but I mean, especially after we got that. Um, well, Boost to Urbosa's Fury. Yeah, Urbosa's Fury Plus. Like he was just. Weak sauce. Yep. Urbosa's Fury Boulder Breaker just yeah crushes him. Yeah. Knock him down and just spin to win, man. He was it was silly. Chump but I mean, I guess this whole part is kind of silly. I mean, like I was saying at the beginning, at the top of the episode, I want to kind of jump through this because like Daruk's story is not very in depth. Like and I think I think there's some reason for that. Like you gotta have you know comedic relief kind of deal but um but in this case it's just like it almost feels like the gorons didn't take anything super seriously (laughs) like uh, after we beat fire blight plus we get we get daruk's song right and all the songs are based around when zelda goes to recruit them to be uh you know the pilots of the divine beasts so this one starts off and Daruk immediately is like, yeah, absolutely. I'll pilot this beast. Oh, by the way, uh, you know, I really think that if you're wandering around Hyrule, like, you know, there's been uh, reports of monster attacks. I really think you guys should have like a Goron guard. Like, yeah. keep the princess safe. <laughs> Goron squad. <laughs> uh, Zelda makes some kind of mention about how like that sounds just like her dad. And she wants this Hylian champion to, to basically go with her everywhere. And he's like, oh, that's got to be that one guy, which is, you yeah. know. She's like, the best swordsman in the land. He's like, I know him. <laughs> I know him. That's uh, my brother. So <laughs> then they come across uh, somebody getting attacked by a horde of bacoblins while they're having this conversation. And Daruk goes beast mode, just mm. wrecks the bacoblins. They're, they're flying through the air. They're screaming. They're running away. He calls them a bunch of brainless cuckoos. Yeah, he pronounces it get... Kukos. Yeah, and official translation. Yeah, or pronunciation. Apparently, it's always supposed to have been Kukos. It's always Kukos. supposed to have been Kukos. <laughs> I don't know. That's that's what you have to assume when they finally put voice acting in a show and pronounce something some way. I know. I just don't know if I can commit to it. I've always called them Kukos. <laughs> oh, I'm definitely I think... not committing to it. <laughs> it's either one of two things. It's either it. Used to be pronounced cuckoo, and Cucko. then they were like, Cucko. Yeah, we don't want to say that word has yeah, been in word. recent light. Next, um, or it's just always been cuckoos. I'd say we'd have to go back to probably the original Japanese voice acting of it and see how they pronounce the, the word, unless it's a totally different word, in which case we'd have to look at like the majority of the uh translations in different languages and kind of find out which one is is more likely to have been the legitimate use yeah i don't i'm still going to go through all that work 
I wonder how yeah. the actual bird is pronounced. Kachu. Well, wouldn't it be like cuckoo clock, right? Like, I don't know. It's not really spelled like that, though. I always thought that's where they got the name, and then they just kind of altered it a bit, and that's how they got yeah. cuckoo. But instead of cuckoo, cuckoo. But that's that's just how I always since I was a kid, you know, like that's how it does I've make said sense it. that it's cuckoo because it's it ends in a, a single O instead of two. Versus, yeah, you know, it'd be like that's true. Ka- yeah, Kuko. I mean, with the O at the end being a vowel at the end would also make the U. The long version, but like the right? whole internet pronounces Kuko. it as like yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know, man. English is silly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think I'm gonna remember enough to to say that right at all ever in the future. And that is the um, that's the, probably the most substantial thing that actually happens in this cutscene, is that pronunciation of Kuko. Uh, and then it turns out that. After defeating the Bacoblins, what they were attacking was actually a dog. Doggo. A dog that's just chilling on Death Mountain, because why wouldn't a dog be chilling on Death Mountain? Not bursting into flames. Yeah, definitely had a fireproof elixir on the way up. Just randomly. Flame breaker dog. Flame breaker dog. (laughs) Oh, jeez. Then we find out that big boy Daruk has uh, canine phobia. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, he gets he gets so scared. The dog barks and he goes into Daruk's protection. And it yeah, is he basically fetal positions. It is humorous, and then he uh, has to make some kind of disclaimer to the princess. He's like, "So this Ganon's not some kind of dog monster, is he?" <laughs> and then they have a lighthearted laugh. They have a lighthearted laugh. Yep. Uh and then yeah, he's actually kind of close though. He's a pig. He yeah. represents a, a a mammal. That is on four legs, so I mean, yeah, I think, uh, I think, hey, Arnold, Arnold's dog was a pig, if I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty sure he just had a pig that ran around mm. with all the dogs in the neighborhood. That does sound vaguely familiar. Yeah, yeah. There's only one like key thing about hey Arnold I even remember anymore, but it's not fit for this. Okay, well, moving on. <laughs> So uh, I took a I took a moment. I went over and read Daruk's journal. He calls it his training journal. At first, he calls it a diary, and he's like, "Oh, maybe I should call this thing a training journal because you know it sounds more manly, and you know all the Gorons have to be super masculine, hyper tough." Uh, so eight pages. They all have eight pages in all of their journals. Every champion has a journal. Uh, I mean, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what these pages are about, and you might catch a pattern for for Daruk here. Uh, first page, he's unsure about what to write. Realizes he could probably write down what he ate today. He ate some uh, uh, rock roast. Yep, figured it'd Yum. be rock. Rock Yum. roast, yep. And then uh, the second one, he's talking about how everyone just wants to talk about Ganon and this divine beast that they dug up a few years ago. And someone's got to pilot that thing, but I'm not really interested in all that. Uh, but what he is interested in is having some rock roast tonight. Maybe he'll mm. have some. Mm. Uh, page three. Uh, this is the meeting. This is the time where Daruk met Link. Uh, he writes a little thing about some some small guy was getting attacked by a bunch of monsters. I went down to try to save him. Uh, turns out they got the jump on me, and this little dude saved me. Like he he kind of took care of himself before I even got to him. So he was surprised about that. I uh, thought that, you know, it might be embarrassing. Surprisingly, nothing about rocks on this page. Oh, man. Page four. Uh, he gives Link some rocks. <laughs> Link, I was gonna eats, say. Link eats them, according to what I'm reading. He liked them oh. so much he was speechless. So I think on that past page, you could metaphorically say he thought Link rocked. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Defeated sad. So he also... <laughs> He uh, he also makes a comment about how Link feels that like when he concentrates, it almost feels like time is slowing down, which is a pretty solid hint that Link's champion ability is actually his you know his fury uh, attack mm-hmm. and or his bullet time mode. Like those are that's actually Link's power is being able to slow his time. Family secret technique. Oh no! Oh no! It's we'll evolved. get to that. 
We'll get to his family secret <laughs> oh, technique. That's coming oh, okay. this episode. That's oh, a different okay. journal. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, uh, and then he also pretty much says that I like Link. He's definitely a certified brother. So, uh, my note for four overall was Link eats rocks, slows time, is a bro. <laughs> is a bro. Is a bro. He's a, he's a broke. Bro rock. But. <laughs> Brock. Okay. So page five. <laughs> He's the first gym leader in Kenya. Uh, Daruk agrees to pilot Rudania. Uh, he also tried to give Zelda a rock roast, but she uh, she gave a grimace look. He figured it had to do something with something else. She must have something else on her mind. He must have undercooked the rock. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. Something went wrong. It's a little uh, raw. Number six. Uh, Daruk remembers the inauguration. Uh, and I guess while he was there, he heard a story about Link deflecting a, a guardian laser with a pot lid. So that was pretty cool. Pretty cool story that he heard and wrote down. Uh, number seven, well, you know, he talks about how like Link was assigned as the guard and he's like, he's a perfect guy for the job, you know, cause he's a bro. So, okay. <laughs> number seven, uh, Daruk was having trouble piloting the beast. And he was the only one of the four who had trouble piloting their divine beast. So Link Not just he, he asked Link for help. Link just kicked him into the divine beast and said, figure it out, locked him in there for like a day. And by the end of the day, he could pilot it. So Link did some sink or swim training with Daruk. That was my favorite page. <laughs> Daruk's like, little, little guy just knew I needed some time in there. <laughs> He's so smart. Yeah, he's like, he, he he has some comment about how Link must have gotten to where he is through hard training or something like that. Some kind of respect, but it's yeah. like so random yeah. compared to what he did, but it's pretty good. All right, so what uh, I want to know is... he Oh, and as a reward, he wants to give Link some girl gourmet sirloin rock. So, just mm. jealous. Make Even sure more there. so, I want to know, what is the power level of Link's digestive system? My dude eats everything, man. I don't think there's a number that can encapsulate <laughs> it. None exist. I mean, he'll uh, eat. My, he'll he'll eat like guardian screws and stuff, man. If you cook that right. into a dish, right? He'll, he'll he'll you know he might lose some health, but he'll do it. He's like you that could, guy that over the course you of an ancient ate a whole airplane. Could even ate the, I, even ate the uh, the light bulbs inside of it and the glass that they're made out of. Hey, no thanks. Uh, all right. So then the last page here, he just kind of talks about how, um, Link and Zelda have been opening up to each other. He thinks that they were opening up to each other over food because of course he does. Um, and then he says that he, what he's learned about himself is that writing makes him hungry. So <laughs> he, he just, some of the stuff that we covered before about, you know, like in episode 50 about Link and Zelda actually growing in their relationship. It's just a little note that he's, he's, he's a witness to it, you know? Um, and that's legitimately all there is. So half being the time, a witness to things probably makes him hungry, right? Half the time he was just writing about food or explaining something obvious that happened. So he doesn't actually really have any depth as a character himself. It seems. I mean, I want to say that's on purpose, though. He's a Goron, which are known to be brute force yeah. and extremely mentally simplistic. Sure. I mean, I think I have a feeling like when Nintendo got this whole like story written out they were like who are the gorons gonna be it's like who have the gorons always been they've been in every single game pretty much <laughs> they're just like super reliable they're there <laughs> we're they not gonna rocks. we're not gonna mess with them too much we're not gonna give them a ton of like deep story they are rocks they are the foundation of this country i don't but know they can't eat boulders in front of the dongo's cavern yes that's for sure. they love to eat rocks they love to have bosses that absorb bombs so that you can throw bombs at them and they'll just <laughs> suck them right up and they love to have problems with giant lizards i don't know like they have they're very they're very patterned um stereotypical gorons <laughs> so well they they're the most unchanging group as well. Like they really don't. They rocks haven't are evolved sturdy, from man. or to. I was going to say kind of like rocks, you know. Yeah, they're they're yeah. unchanging, and you can they're, peel a rock's layer back, but under that rock's layer is just another layer of rock. They're like the an onion or an ogre. They're the constant yeah. in the equation that is the Legend of Zelda. 
How do you yeah. know it's a Zelda game? It has a Goron. <laughs> nothing to do with Link. Nothing Gorons to do with Zelda. Nothing to insane. do with the Master Sword. It's the Gorons. They're the rock foundation of the series. The Legend of Goron. <laughs> <laughs> now that what, would be a game. What could go wrong? <laughs> no, Imagine a no. racing game where you play as like Gorons and you have to like Goron champions throughout the series and just race. Now, now we're on to something. Goron Super <laughs> Circuit. Spin-off <laughs> game. <laughs> Rainbow Rock Road. <laughs> if only the DS was still going strong, I could see that being Rock a game. Rainbow Road. <laughs> <laughs> all right. At the end, you get your own sirloin. That's always, that's always the prize. Either gold dust or rock sirloin. Mm. And the Gorons are always more excited about rock sirloin than they are about gold dust. Yep. A year supply of rock that, sirloin. That gold dust could probably buy a lot of rock sirloins. They don't care. There you go. <laughs> All right. So we can go ahead and move on <laughs> to Mifa's story, which has all the depth. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, you know, watery. Anyway, so. Unrequited love. Yeah. There's a lot here. Actually, we don't know how unrequited it is. It's a little bit open ended here. Which is cool. I like that. I like that about a story having it be open ended, but mm-hmm. still have some depth and some meaning and some character development. Um, but yeah, so we learn a lot about Mifa here. But we go to the uh, Mifa's obelisk to start her quest, where Cass is going to talk to us about her and eventually give us the song. Uh, and we learn about three challenges uh, once again. The first one being to fly into the sunrise. Uh, and in this shrine, I'll just go shrines by the challenge this time. Uh, it's a, you melt a bunch of ice. It's just a room with a bunch of blocks of ice and you got to find your way up to a second floor and across the way using ice. It's, um, it took forever because melting ice with the methods I use just take very long because I, I don't know. I don't like to waste resources stand on there stuff with a like great this. Fl- flame blade. Yeah, just stand there with something hot and let let it just time pass until you have a platform. Takes takes sweet forever. You could just shoot it with a fire arrow; it'd be a lot faster. But uh, not really my style for stuff like this. I don't want to waste fire arrows on ice blocks. I don't know why. It's just yeah. You don't have a million amiibo cards, so. <laughs> well, I do, but I don't <laughs> use them. <laughs> um. Yeah. The next one is Defeat Flying Guardians. Now, of all of the champion bosses, the things that the champions have made us fight, Mifa had a tough challenge here, apparently, in the past. Mm-hmm. She she went off and just fought a bunch of Flying Guardians. I don't know why. How? But that's, uh, that's the challenge. And uh, once you get in, it's like a, it's like a, I mean, th- this is almost like copy paste of another shrine in the game, except a little more complicated. Like it's so it's like the big the waterfall, waterfall yeah, like, with a bunch of like ramps and stuff. Despise this one. <laughs> I think I cheated on this one. To be completely honest, I, I I'm pretty sure I did something like um, I don't know, like get the ball stuck somewhere and then cryonis it and fling it across the room, that kind of thing. <laughs> Like I don't, oh, I don't know that I actually solved the puzzle that they were presenting me with, uh, but it worked out. I ended up getting it. But yeah, nice. big big waterfall, bunch of spinny platforms and gaps and stuff. I I I, can't, I couldn't for the life of me describe to you how to beat it from memory. It was a vicarious guy that I watched. Um, I was the vicarious guy watching him. He put a. <laughs> An icicle in a certain spot, they hit the corner of it and launched it almost directly sideways, and that was how he got as much distance as he needed to get it to go where it needed to go. It was a, like very precise. I think he had to put down like six of them in order to actually get it to stick. Mm. Like to be and the it went to the angle. hole. No, it didn't go straight to the hole. It went over and then it went down into this thing, and then it shot up, and the thing had um like one of the like, pinball kind of boingy yeah. thingies and it shot it up and then then it went to the hole oh mm. okay so it was all about the main area that it falls through you just have to knock it like considerably over to the right and gotcha. then it would fall into what it ultimately just landed in the right spot gotcha yeah i think i got the ball stuck and then just did a cryonis bounce or something i i really don't remember how i did it but yeah 
yeah, going on just straight on what it is is not fun. Um, so the last one is you have to again time trial through some rings, except you got to swim up some waterfalls. So if you don't have the Gore, the Zora set that lets you do that, which I think is a story quest thing, I think you just need the shirt, right? Yeah, you yeah. you have to get the shirt. So you have to get the shirt. You just use your Zora shirt. Fly That's up basically waterfall. free. Yeah. Uh, super easy one to do because the waterfalls are like self-centering once you're on them. Mm -hmm. So there's not a ton of challenge to this one. Uh, and your stamina comes back while you're going up waterfalls. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah totally. You, you're being lifted on, on love's wings, you know? <laughs> so, no so you get... Uh, up and you get into a shrine that has the secret stairway. Now, when we talked about Urbosa, I kept mentioning the secret stairway because I got confused because there's actually two different stairway esque shrine challenges. One of them is the zappy one that's Urbosa's, and I don't even know what the name of that shrine is, but it's not secret stairway. Uh, I don't know. Um, but it is a stairway, and then there's this one that's actually called secret stairway, and it it's like a cryonis waterfall metal blocks on rails challenge i watched i watched a uh, a video to refresh myself on it because i played this like weeks ago um and the guy that i watched do it just did a cryonis on the metal block climbed onto it flew, flew up in the air and then uh just beat the whole shrine just from that one jump so he didn't actually make a staircase he just launched himself interesting and i felt so dumb when i saw that i was like you gotta be kidding me <laughs> Like, why yeah. did I even do this, though? <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. I thought the only way to beat it was to drag the blocks up with Magnesis all the way to the top, switch to Cryo, like, super quick, and freeze them, and then put a block under them. Yeah, he lifted it up and put a block under it so that he could get the right angle on the Cryonis. And then he, he, I don't, he charged it up and then shot it to go uh. up. And then he jumped up and climbed onto it so that it then launched him up. Um, very, very smooth very smart not hard to do from what i saw and i was like i would have never thought to think that <laughs> i would have never thought to think that man that's crazy that's crazy um so then we can go to water blight plus Ooh. which is also not that bad when you have herbosis fury plus yeah yeah and mifa comes stacked with three tridents yeah the first time I ever did this, I didn't do uh, the Thunder Plus, and also I didn't realize that that was the best strategy. Because uh, I've done this DLC, this part of the DLC anyway, I've done twice. Once in my first playthrough that I still haven't finished, and then once in my podcast playthrough that I have finished at this point. Um, and so this one... The first time I did it, I had no clue what I was doing, wasted all my weapons, had to do like the bomb throws from across the room kind of thing where I'd put up a cryonis, throw a bomb to land on the cryonis so that it would roll further and then I would blow it up on the guy and I just chipped him away <laughs> bomb by bomb and it took sweet forever, but I did get through it and it was a bad strategy and now that I know <laughs> that was so bad because if you just if you just Urbosa's Fury, the guy, he falls from the ceiling and you can just hit him a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't have to throw your spears at him and waste your spears. <laughs> oh. I, did, I did bad the first time. <laughs> did much better this time. This time you got to learn to fight easy. with limited equipment. Yeah, I mean, I, before Urbosa's Fury didn't even occur to me. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Just didn't think to do it. Um, I mean, to be fair, Urbosa's Fury was always the last one I would get, so I'd never like used it against a boss before. And it was like the first time, it was literally the first DLC boss that I did, and I've totally forgot that I even had that and that it would be effective. Yeah, it definitely um, comes in. It's effective it. against everything, it's effective against everything, even lightning based enemies. <laughs> they don't, they don't, they're not immune. Nope. I'm like questioning how Mifa failed here because she didn't have water blight. Fury. 
uh, even beside that point, I mean, like Water Blade Ganon floats above the water and has a spear and whoop de doo. Mifa can swim very fast. If she swims as fast as Sidon, I don't know, but I'm assuming she can because. You know, same family training and such. There, there's a memory that would speak to how fast she can swim. So, like, how did she fail? I mean, she's able to go underwater and jump up and just strike the guy, and then you know, maybe she lost eye in, the, in the first phase for all the projectiles. Right. I mean, like, use first, your brain, Mifa. First phase, there's only like ankle deep water, so maybe she lost in the first phase. <laughs> maybe. Just couldn't just, even get to the second phase. <laughs> She's got to swim. It's like it's three inches of water. I don't care. Swim. <laughs> she starts flopping around on the ground. Oh no, it's over. <laughs> Me for you, splash. Oh no, <laughs> it wasn't very effective, y'all. She's not even level twenty. She she needs to evolve. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just Mifa trying knows. to think of what the Gyarados Mifa would be. Don't. Okay. No, <laughs> right. Google probably has that. It would be. It would be like the Manticore, but it's that it would just be the Gyarados. With <laughs> Did Mifa you just face. say Google probably has that? Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Anthony's on the search. All right, we're just gonna wait and see if something pops into our chat for the Mifa uh, news. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, oh. we beat Water Blight Ganon. Anthony found something that he seems uh <laughs> disturbed by. <laughs> yep. All right. <laughs> well, if it's Accurate. private chat, we'll go ahead and throw that up. Otherwise, let's let's move on. Um, because we get Mifa's song, which is a memory about Mifa. And uh, getting invited to be a pilot of the Divine Beast. Uh, she, you know, Zelda comes up to Mifa, basically is counting off the other people on the team. Uh, Daruk is listed as Goron Vigilance. And uh, Rivali is Rito Confidence. And Urbosa is Gerudo Spirit. <laughs> Cam's, Cam's cutting off Rivali on the Rito Confidence. <laughs> it's more like Rito Arrogance, right? Like it's a little too far. No, it was the picture I was looking at. Oh. Is it? It's a... it's ridiculous. It's basically just shiny Mifa. That's all right. Okay. Okay. That's enough of that. <laughs> Speaking of Revali though, now that we've well, almost covered, I guess, all of the champions and their stories in the DLC extended director's cut. Okay. <laughs> Revali has Officially, and I know I'm gonna get some hate for this. Don't maybe even. from both don't, of you. Don't do this. Don't do this but to yourself. Ravali, for me personally, has become my personal favorite character no. of the champions. <laughs> no. And the, what I have to say about this is the this reason is he is joke. my personal favorite character is because. He has so much depth. Of all the champions, aside from like the love story with Mifa and then Urbosa's motherliness, he has the most depth of a character, the most reflections, the most like outward <sighs> appearance versus inner shallowness got, versus outward. You, okay. You got Cam writing things. Look what you did. You're breaking your mother's <laughs> heart. <laughs> Cameron's writing stuff. <laughs> all right, look. <laughs> you need to watch some videos on Ravali. I have. I've watched the, them. Oof. The man. No. It, it's just this whole story of like, I actually like, yeah, he's a <sighs> jerk outwardly to Link. But yeah, the thing about that is I can't remember everything from the video, honestly. Look, but, his, his, his ego is on narcissism level. That's all I need to not like him as a character that much. Listen, get him out of here. We've we've talked about Rivali. We've talked about his his few <laughs> redeeming qualities. Yeah, yeah as a but like being within that the was universe. in the episode where we were covering his story. Oh, and and if you actually look into it more, the man is 
conflicted and he's just trying to get acceptance from Link and Link's kind of brushing him off and it's just fueling the Link can't talk. more. He can talk. He brushes he, everybody I off. I don't know that he is just trying to get acceptance though. My dude well, wants like, to be the champion and he well, just you look can't at the, get over it. He's not, he lacks humility on so many levels. But if you look at the part where he actually accepted Link and then he had that whole bit where he flew off to the Divine Beast and uh, was just kind of looking for Link's validation of his secret technique that he came up with. That part right there shows he's just trying to get acceptance. He's just trying to see, you know, Link, do you... I recognize you as being who you are. Do you at least recognize my validity We've both come from the same like part of working our butts off to get to where we are. And Link just kind of like doesn't say anything, which makes Ravali mad and fly off. And that's the last time they talk. That's but that's not what he yeah. says. But Link had all. to put him in his place multiple times before it got to that. Before that, it was I'm so much better than you. You can't even fly. You can't even get to the sky. You can't oh, I'm even not your he's not a jerk. I'm just saying he's my favorite character. He is so pompous. At no point does he ever say to Link, like, hey, I put a lot of work into this and like it was really hard for me to do and it would mean a lot to me if you thought it was cool. Like that's not – that's never what the – the conversation never sounds like he wants acceptance. It's just abrasive and, and rude. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would go back and watch the videos. I have seen the videos. <laughs> mm. The arguments are understandable. It's just that you have to read so far just to find where this guy came from and why you would want to think. And that's that way. why I like him so much because, because of the depth because he masks he his actual hard work and his good qualities with his total tool bagginess. <laughs> <laughs> the guy. The guy. He is hilariously awesome He's... as a character in Zelda. Like, think of this from a perspective of Zelda. When do they make a character like this abrasive, this like, you know, this much depth? You have to dig so deep just to see where he's coming from versus his like the first time you play through the game and you just like brush him into it as a character. He comes off as a complete I pompous jerk, but then I... you actually look into it. It's you like, know what oh. else you got to dig deep to find? The good mm. rocks. The good rocks. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So All he's right. become my I character. I don't even that's... know why we're talking about Revali. <laughs> oh, no, I was just saying because we, like, reviewed all the characters. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. They could have done more with Revali's redemption arc. If you're going to have hoping... Revali be a good character... They could have changed him so much more than they did. By the end, all we got was a, oh, I guess I'll have to admit he actually did something that I couldn't. And it's like... Bro. Also, to be fair, I did watch the Age of Calamity stuff. They do well, explore him a little bit more so that you can kind of see even more of like who he is versus yeah. who he shows as Link. But that's not like even canon, though. <laughs> it's canon. Age of Calamity? Yeah. No, Is it all his dad even hug him though? Like <laughs> Yeah, it's a good story. I don't know. They didn't have it, him in it's there. A, it's a, it might be a good story, but they, they definitely like went out of their way to say this is like al- alternate universe level type stuff. Yeah, it's an alternate dimension, basically. Yeah. Time travel. Kind of like Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, all right. Uh okay. So can we get back to me <laughs> the song? <laughs> now that we're done talking about Revolt. All right. Rivali, which is literally just rival misspelled. Anyway, so Mifo. Um Yeah, so Zelda goes through this whole list of the champions, including Rito Confidence that we just got done talking about. Uh and then mentions that we also have the Hylian with the sword that seals the darkness link. And you can tell that Mifa's like got some extra thoughts about that one. You can also tell that Zelda kind of crosses her arms over her chest when she sa- and she talks about him, and then that seems particularly to be what Mifa is uh, responding to. Yeah, because she straight up like dismisses this conversation for a minute right after she gets done saying this, and she goes back to her training side on. She's like, 
you know, like clearly, I mean, she, she's, she's in it. Like we know that she's going to say yes and she's going to agree and all that. And there's actually more reason to that than just like this conversation. Uh, we'll get to that when we get to the diary. Um, but, uh, she's training baby Sidon to swim up waterfalls. He's so cute. Oh yeah. His head is too big for his little body. And his big smile with his little ting. Oh my goodness. <laughs> he's got the big eyes because he's a he's a he's a chibi, <laughs> basically in this whole scene. He doesn't um, talk. But he's she tells him to swim up and, and Zelda kind of suggests like, hey, maybe he's too little for this. And she's like, listen, like one day I might not be here for him. He's gotta learn, you know. <laughs> That's not exactly what she says, but that's the essence of it. Yeah. So she goes surfing down this waterfall in the most epic of fashions, uh, goes down to meet baby Sidon, says, hey, how about you come with me so you can get a feel for it? And then does like a shoot back up the waterfall. Uh, pretty cool. Pretty helpful for baby Sidon. Mm -hmm. um, and she basically tells him like, hey. Uh, you know, I'm counting on you to protect to protect our people if fate should ever separate us. Basically, just trying to emphasize the importance, like you need to be capable uh, in case, you know, I'm not I'm not always going to be here to help you out with this stuff. Um, then he gives a big cool. smile, a big smile, that same big smile that we get years later. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Ting tingling. He, he uses that uh, trident, you know. Or orbits, right? It's got that. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but how? But how does your mouth feel? <laughs> Ding. Right. They paid him in gum. <laughs> they paid him in gum. Uh, my goodness. We're we're mixing our gum. Our yeah, gum. I think that was trident. <laughs> that was trident. <laughs> trident layers. All right. Um. So on to, on to Mifa's diary. Uh, very cool stuff. Sorry if I'm like just ranting this stuff off. I, we're still, we still have so much more to do and we're about an hour in right now. So about just trying to, trying to keep things a moving. Um, so yeah. So the diary, once again, eight pages, but this one, uh, we can spend a little bit more time on, I think, because it's like one of the more interesting stories in my book. Well, in her book, I guess, but uh yeah, because she's a Zora, she actually takes she actually has like a, a wider span of years as well in her diary for her eight pages. Uh, the first of which is when a group of Hylians came to visit uh, the Zora's domain. Uh, one of which was Link at age four. Wow, he's this many, and he um he uh he was already known to be able to take on full adults in sparring. Like his swordsmanship was legendary. Get out of here. <laughs> a four year old toddler just <laughs> whooping on the royal guard. <laughs> it's just it's a it's a funny image, but it's like straight out of like uh I don't know, like meet the Spartans or something. Like there's Hold no on. there's no reason for this to be a thing. <laughs> Diaper change break. It's like a spoof of reality. There's just no way. No. Nah. Um but I mean, hey, if the game wants to tell this story, why not? Um, but uh, during their stay, Mifa was not only impressed by this, but also healed some bruises that he had from from these sparring bouts, I take it. Um, and he had never seen healing magic before. And she describes how cute he was when his eyes like went big from seeing the healing magic and and being healed. Um, so oh. in interesting story. Uh, second page, they talk about bringing out Divine Beast Varuta. Uh, she talks about how, like, you know, uh, you know, you know, somebody has to pilot this thing. She's like, I wonder who they'll pick. Uh, it's kind of crazy to imagine somebody in the distant past piloting this. Like, you know, I wonder who's next. Like, it's very much like innocent. Like, oh, like, she does. She doesn't have any clue that she could be the one that would be asked to pilot it next, which is. You know, even though she's part of the royal family and has healing magic, yeah, like all the all the reasons why she would actually be the only candidate. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever. Um, page four. No, oh, no, sorry. Page three. Link comes back. Uh, like she she basically said like another. I don't know if it's another group with Zelda or what, but Link is a part of this group once again. 
Um, but he's quiet. He doesn't talk much anymore. And he's always like, he says, she says like, I don't know if it's his height, but it always seems like he's looking past me <laughs> into the distance. Um, <laughs> And he doesn't talk as much as he, she, she says that she asked him if something was wrong and he said no. But um, basically, he's he's on a mission now. Like, he, he knows the calamity is on its way and, like, he's very much dutiful. Um, probably going through that whole, like, training to be the best he can be or whatever. Like, probably pr before him and Zelda were getting along, that kind of thing. Like, just very much dedicated, let me train in the rain kind of link. Um, so then on the fourth page, uh, she agrees to pilot Ruta, um, and the, she gives the reasons why she says that a, she'd be able to defend her people, like she'd be able to do something that's right for, for the Zora, uh, and B, uh, she knows that Link is going to be on the team and he's going to be the one fighting Ganon. And it's another way for her to support Link. So mm -hmm. For first mention it's the best thing I can do for my people second mention I get to help Link <laughs> so she's she is cons he is consistently on her mind here um, so then number five Link and Mifa have this little thing where Mifa tells him about the Lionel up on uh, Ploymus Mountain which is the same one that we can fight in modern day right when you go to get the Thunder Arrows uh, I don't know if it's the exact same Lionel, but it's the same place. So Link immediately is like, I'm on it. Let's go do this. And she's like, I want to come with you. He says, don't do that. She does anyway. <laughs> like while they're arguing about it, the Lionel comes out of nowhere and attacks the two of them. And she says that she was worried, but she shouldn't have been because Link just riggedy wrecked this guy. Yeah. Uh, it was the most graceful moves ever. She could tell how much he cared about defending the people and like doing what was best for, you know, for Hyrule or whatever, like basically she's in awe, not only because of his skill, but because of his motivations. Like he can see that, or she can see that he cares deeply about other people. Um, and also takes note of his spin attack. She can read <laughs> his heart his, through his sword skills. The special move that he did is called a spin attack and he's going to try it with her spear. So, so in oh, case, yeah, she wants to, she wants to emulate <laughs> in, it. in case we go tie up some, some metaphors and some some references here. Mifa gonna try out that family technique. <laughs> cause, she, Cause she won't be part of that family. No, mm. oh, no. <laughs> so anyways. Mifa Diesel. Mifa Diesel. Family. Family. That's where it's at. Uh page six. That was page five. This is this is a long diary, y'all. Uh, so Mifa goes and talks to her dad about piloting the Divine Beast. He gives he gives her his blessing, but like almost everybody else on the court is like, nah. Like they they're all emotional. They're crying. They're leaving the room. Mizu and whoever else. They're all like, this is the worst. We're gonna lose Mifa. They're so sad and angry, you know. Um. And then a side note, after this whole this whole thing goes down, she notes that her armor that she's making for Link is almost ready. <laughs> that she thinks she'll, uh, you know, she has all the materials that she needs to start making it. Uh, so I shouldn't say the armor is ready. The materials are ready. Page seven. Uh, Mifa, this is this is talking about the inauguration, uh, which we're going to actually see a memory of. So I might as well like share some details about this now, but she keeps thinking about the um, basically about the photo shoot that happened during that memory uh, or during the inauguration, I should say, because um, it doesn't outright say this, but she she's basically like can't stop thinking about uh, how grateful she is that Zelda uh, kind of agreed to her request and then thanks uh, is grateful that Daruk brought them closer together, like her and Link. Uh, and this is all very cryptic until you see the memory and then you realize what all that means. Uh, and I think maybe we do just save that until we see the memory. But it is it is kind of funny uh, once you realize what she's talking about. Um, and then there's a side note that she also heard that Link is going to be appointed as the main knight to protect Zelda and that they're going to be spending a lot of time together. Oh, 
so she's um she's definitely having some some jealous feelings. Uh, I think she might even mention that the armor is almost ready, but I don't know that it's on this page. Um, so then the last page here, page eight, uh, Mifa finished the armor, and she actually talks about an ancient, uh, an ancient Zora princess who fell in love with a Hylian, which is like a straight up a, another reference to the sage princess Rudo, right? Uh, and so as she's talking about this, she's like, I'm going to like link is coming back here soon. Um, this will be my chance to give him the armor. And it doesn't mention like the trip up to, uh, up to, uh, like the spring of wisdom or anything. So I think this actually happened before the calamity that he was going to be making this trip and that they were going to have some time. Um, which leads me to believe that Mifa did propose to link. <clears throat> Like she actually went through with this uh, and we just don't, we haven't heard the results of it. Like we haven't seen how that went down, like what Link said, what they did, any of that. Um, but she does say that she finished the armor. She's like, she's going to be here. Here's my chance. And then she, she basically asks the, uh, the ancient, <laughs> uh, the ancient Sora princess for strength in this endeavor. So yeah. Yeah. Love. And she definitely doesn't have Rudo's attitude. <laughs> no, no, not at all. She's actually, <laughs> um, I mean, like, she she definitely seems very meek whenever she's around the other champions. But when you see her training side on, she's very much, like, stern and dutiful. Like, very much, like, here's here's the most important thing. It seems like whenever, whenever the, the Zora people or, like, the sake of others is involved... She's actually very confident and very forward. Um, it's just like whenever that's not the case, she's very much soft and high pitched and like, you know, puts herself in the background more so. Rudo's like a very, at least from her stature, is like a very young Zora. And I, if, if it's not even like the same species of Zora or whatever, but you could kind of go on to say like, I think Mifa's like a almost a hundred or something close to it. Like she's, she's past 50 um, given her stature and size and like height <laughs> compared to like the other Zoras. So we lost cam for a second. Oh no. It, it's so yeah. Like that's kind of showing to her dutifulness being a hundred almost. She's kind of more been around the block a little bit and knows how to retain <laughs> herself and, What's going on over there? I don't know. <laughs> Every time thoughts. you mention that she's over 100, I got to do like the, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Oh. I mean, we don't know that she's over 100, do we? <sighs> There's something somewhere that says she's she's up there because it was like someone, we don't know for sure, but I think it's either an age of calamity or someone did a measurement that said like, these Zoras versus this age versus this height versus the way they look with the ears and like the little things on their face and like how their like face stretches as they get older. She's about like 75 to 100 at that point because if when Sidon grows up, he's 100, but he looks like he's like 20. So I mean, that's kind of where Meath yeah. is at. This is, this is definitely like Elven Princess falls in love with Strider the Rogue, right? I mean, this isn't. Yeah the age is going to be a very confusing thing. If you focus on it too much, <laughs> don't, don't, not, don't, I'm just saying like, stare she's, at the picture too long. My guy, she's dutiful. So she's, she's been around the block versus, you know, Rudo who we never got to see grow up to be a dutiful princess. She was probably like what? 30, 40, maybe less. If we're taking Zora age. Yeah. I mean, she but definitely she's... was, I mean, all of the royal family cared deeply about her. I mean, like at least the council did anyway. You could tell because they all threw a fit when they found out she was going to pilot a divine beast. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I don't know how many princessly duties she was taking on aside from being the healer. Um, She's wicked with a spear. She probably trains. Yeah. The military. In fact, I think they actually said that, like, Somewhere that she used to train some of the Zoras. 
in in combat or in healing? In combat, well, I guess they wouldn't really ha- all have healing, would they? I think that was just no. her thing. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I I think the story is interesting from, like, just I mean, of all the of all the relationships that people love to try to throw on Link. <laughs> in all the games and all the past ages like this is almost like the most outright like somebody straight up proposed to him but i mean i guess if you want to count kid rudo from ocarina of time i mean she did like a backhanded underhanded proposal in a way but um this one it seems much more deliberate and much more like she knew link his whole life essentially um though there were years where they didn't see each other uh, from the story, uh, she still met him several times and, and learned about his character and uh, like, didn't even like, as far as I can tell, never went through like a conflict time of like, Oh, I hate this guy. Why is he always around? It was just always like, she was always curious and always learned something new about him that she appreciated more to the point where she actually proposed to him. Um, I've heard theories. I mean, obviously, that's all you can do at this point is like, did she propose? What was the answer? How did that play out? Were they going to wait until after the war to get married? You know, like, or did he say, no, you're a fish? You know, (laughs) like, who knows? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) But, um, you know, most people see Mifa as Link's first, like, relationship. Um, and I think that it comes from some of the looks that they give each other and cutscenes, like actually like right before the calamity hits when she's having that thought of like, Oh, you know, what helps me use my powers is when I think of dot, dot, dot. And I don't think she would have said that had link said no, you know, like, I think she would have, she might've even been like kind of towing that line of saying, like, when I think about the person like she probably wouldn't have said that I'm engaged to, but she might've said like that I care deeply about or that I'm in love with or whatever. Um, who knows, but that's, that's my thoughts on it. It just seems like there was definitely like a positive outcome to that proposal one way or another. Um, cause I, you know, it just, that's the way it reads to me. Uh, so it seems like they had a thing going on before before the calamity went and took it all away. Um, and I think that this journal t- shows you a lot about who Mifa is and what her priorities actually are in life. So um, honestly, my favorite diary to read <laughs> like of the four that I've read. Uh, it's probably the, the most interesting one. Um, I think Urbosa is like right there too. But Ravali just makes me angry. <laughs> and I feel like they could have done more with the Rook. I, I think he's just super shallow and just wants to talk about Rock. food. Yeah. So, yeah. If you have any idea how I feel about these champions. What's Agoron's favorite genre of music? <laughs> Rock and roll. Nobody was surprised by that. Yeah, I know. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Your joke is broken. <laughs> oh, it fits. It fits too. It's, it's too. It's, it, it's the only one that fits, though. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then, now that we've gotten all of the songs and all of the memories and we've done all of the champions things, we can do the final the final dungeon of the game. Uh, well, not really of the game. The final dungeon of the DLC. We'll do the final of the dungeon of the game next episode. So the final dungeon of the DLC is is a masterpiece. Enough said. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> no it's um it's basically a giant machine like every there's four there's four main uh arms that come off of one central fuselage if you want to call it that 
big, big old cylinder with a bunch of cylinders coming off of it. And um, everything is spinning except for the main section, I believe. Uh, and in each of these sections, you get basically the key or the way to open the next one. But you get, I think there's like terminals in each one, kind of like a divine beast. And they're themed. One of them is filled with lava and has like a spike bridge that you got to kind of traverse. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them has like some key locking mechanisms to kind of get the whole thing to spin in different ways. Um, one of them has a big old wind turbine that you got to change the directions of a few times. And one of them, uh, you flood with water and then drain the water back out. And it's a thing. So they're all like elementally based. Uh, the only one that I thought was weird is that the key locking one didn't seem to have a lot of electricity, at least from what I remember. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I would have expected lightning to be one of these things, and I didn't. I don't remember seeing that, but maybe I'm just misremembering. One of the rooms had uh, one of like the green arrows that car carries uh, the flow of electricity through it. So okay. I don't. That was probably the one that is supposed to be related to electricity, and yeah, not really a whole lot that it does aside from power, like one main spinning unit. Gotcha. Yeah, it's cool though. I mean, like each one you go into, you you get a terminal, you come back out. And then there's like some other new boss waiting for you in the middle of the room, usually guardian based Sheikah technology, that kind of thing. Um, but I had a lot of fun in here. It, you know, I, it's the first time I've ever gotten this far in the DLC, first time I ever did this dungeon. Um, I don't know if I would find it as fun the second time, but the first time because it was novel, I had a blast. <laughs> it was it was good stuff. I don't know. I, I don't know that I remember seeing anything that made me like like, you know, that was enlightening to the story of the game. Um, but it was a very good example of what uh, a dungeon could be uh, in the next game. You know, it's one of those situations where you kind of feel like, no, you disagree. <laughs> I hope no. not. It wasn't long enough to be a dungeon. I no. hope that there's many more rooms and many more puzzles and yeah, big old. Everybody, that part. statement that I just made is what most people say about Hyrule Castle. Um about like that being what a dungeon could be in the next game. I don't know if I don't know if we're going to get that lucky. I really hope, I really hope so. <laughs> but but like I think of all the divine beasts, like the four different divine beasts we talked about like which ones of those was our favorite and everything. I think this one was top tier divine beast. I think it's about as good as as far as you could throw a divine beast and like still have something that's interesting. Um, it was I mean, there. I'll tell you. I'll tell you one thing: <laughs> divine beast aside or not, we get to fight what I call is the final boss fight of the game for me yeah. because yeah. this boss fight is ridiculously cool versus the boss fight at the end of the game for me. But I digress. It's not sadly, but it's still really fun. Yeah. Yeah, so this is um, Moss Kashaya. Gesundheit. Exactly. Ma Moss Kashaya fights like Koga a little bit. <laughs> it's what Koga wants to be. <laughs> yeah, Koga, <laughs> Koga wishes he had all these moves, but he does have a couple of them. Uh, no, it's just it's just when you first start fighting him, like there's a lot there's a lot of Koga DNA there, which is funny because you know the um. The uh, the Wichimacallums, the Yiga, were an offshoot of the Sheikah, and that's what this is, is Sheikah Sage. Um, mm -hmm. And he's a much better boss fight. He has, he has way better moves overall. It's just, it's just interesting to see how many they do share when you first start the round. He's mm -hmm. not comic relief. He's not comic relief. He's actually pretty intimidating when he first starts to move, and you're like, oh, snap, these things can move. Uh, not only can they move, but they can, uh, <laughs> they can throw down. <laughs> <laughs> they, they they can bring the smoke. This, this guy. You can say that again. He's got he's got like thunder blight Ganon speed, <laughs> which I thought was kind of annoying, but also kind of cool when you landed it right. Um, the dude and got, he actually learned from Naruto too. Mm -hmm. He took some training lessons. He's got shadow clone jutsu. He's got the shadow clones. Ooh. He's got expansion jutsu. Man, he can do everything. Yeah. He gets he gets real big. Um, I thought that was kind of funny actually when he came out and he was huge and I was like, hey, <laughs> big guy. 
<laughs> and he shoots a massive guardian laser at you like huh excuse me yeah he's got I, i'm honestly i can't even recount all the moves but you fight this guy on a giant floating platform arena above hyrule uh and it's just like he it, it, you know the battle starts out he looks like any of one of the other uh sages that you would find in one of the shrines Except, you know, he starts creaking. He's like, I got one more challenge for you. And then he starts, like, you know, creaking into movement and becomes this epic boss. Um, yeah. Fantastic fight. Fantastic boss fight. Um, had a lot of fun with this one. I don't know. It's cool. It's cool stuff. Flying Island or made me think of uh, uh, Tears of the Kingdom. Immediately when I got up there, I was like, oh, maybe we come back here. Maybe this platform is still here. <laughs> oh, man. Probably won't be fighting Mosca Shia again, but maybe something else will be up here now. Maybe, maybe this Rakoga comes back. <laughs> oh, no. We finally Mosca find him Shia. underground. <laughs> he comes back up to the surface with us, chases us all the way to this platform. I hope we see him again. We are definitely going to see him underground for sure. He like you're going to be able to go down underground and find him there. And he's either going to be a boss fight or he's going to be like, bro, I need help. I need to get out of here. <laughs> I think he would I've be mended my ways. I think it would be hilarious to find him. But instead of leading the Yiga, he's leading like a Bacoblin camp or something. <laughs> <laughs> like they're just like worshiping him randomly. <laughs> like, he's I don't know. He's just made a new underground life for himself with whatever followers he could find. I think that'd be he hilarious. Just, he just dances. <laughs> does his his does his nightly ceremonies with the with the bananas in the square. Oh jeez. <laughs> so many bananas. Turns out Bacoblins love them. <laughs> they can't get enough of these yellow fruits. <laughs> they get so strong. Oh, gosh. All right. But that is, um, whew. I mean, that is, that is the main challenge of the DLC. There's just one thing left to talk about, and that's uh, going back to Cass after all this is said. My and done. second favorite well, Rito. Cassie Boy. Cassie boy. Well, I mean, we guess we talk about the the master cycle zero if you really wanted to. Motorcycle, heck Motorcycle. yeah! Summon so, it from your tablet of power. Yeah. So after Link does all of the challenges from all of the other champions, he gets his own divine beast. <laughs> he had to do five times the work of all of the <laughs> other champions to get a motorcycle. Which is shaped like a horse, but with wheels. And then it can go up cliffs. It can go up cliffs. It can bounce on bokoblins. It can eat monster parts and use them for fuel. It does it all. It does it all. <laughs> uh, I did use it in my final ascent up Hyrule Castle. Mm. But only on a couple spots. <laughs> <laughs> Where it made sense to do that. I did I would not use it see... for the final battle, though. <laughs> I would love to see, like, an action sequence with that that music, like, da -ding 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 -ding, and, like, Link's just rolling in, like, dodging Guardian lasers, going in down the main street of Courtyard Hyrule, Castletown, just rolling past it through the was gates. Was that the Team America theme song? I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It was. Okay. Yeah, it was. Sorry, just checking. Hey, y'all, <laughs> if you want a fam family friendly podcast experience, don't look up that song. <laughs> no, that's why I didn't name it. I just went dun, 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 dun. Yeah. and uh -huh. just have Link like dodging Guardian lasers going up and just. <laughs> I want to see that movie. So, aside from this super cool motorcycle that we get that completely breaks mobility in this game goes faster than the game can load in areas for whatever reason. Um, there is also a return to Cass. I mean, I kind of just briefly mentioned this before, but there's one last memory that we can kind of watch, and it's a memory of the actual inauguration. 
Uh, so Cass gives you the champion's ballad, right? The champion song that we've been working at this whole time. It's a song to capture you as a champion uh, and all the champions, I guess, because it, 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 it transports you to a time. It brings back Link's memory of the inauguration because Cass just nails it on the head so well that he's able to bring back your memories. Uh, and in this inauguration starts off and the king's giving this whole speech like you're in the court, right? Like all the knights and all the, the people of Hyrule are like around this court. Uh, King's up on like the second floor giving this grand speech about how you guys have been chosen as these epic champions. and You're going to go forth and save Hyrule. Uh, and then he goes into how the blue that you're all wearing is symbolic of the royal family. Uh, and that your outfits have been designed by his daughter, Princess Zelda. And he's so proud of his daughter's. I don't design work, I guess. Fashion design. Nice. Um, this is actually part of the inspiration, not this scene specifically, but um, that blue and the connection to the silent princess flower, which is also like Zelda's blue. It's like where it comes from. <laughs> uh, the, the artwork for our, for our podcast this season and the blue that Kim is currently wearing and pointing out are all interlinked. But. <laughs> but it's funny because there are five blue and white petals on a silent princess flower, and it just m seemed to match up perfectly with the five blue sashes that the champions were all given. I don't know. I feel like there's some, there's some cultural uh, relevance to that, like flowers being used in storytelling in Japanese culture. I don't know enough about it to speak intelligibly about it, but I feel like there is... There's enough there to say, hey, this was probably intentional. This was probably on purpose. Um, mm -hmm. Like the five petals, the five champions, the blue connecting everything. Representative of the royal family. And they are the new found family of the royal princess. And, you know, all that. All that nonsense. Um, but yeah. So they go through this ceremony. Uh, and then later you see all the champions outside after the ceremony. Uh, having a little decompress sesh, right? Daruk starts off by saying, oh man, these formal gigs always tire me out. And then uh, you see Rivali standing with like uh, Zelda and Ur Urbosa and they're, you know, he picks up the Sheikah Slate. He's like, oh, so this is the Sheikah Slate, huh? And Zelda's like, yeah, but we haven't quite figured it out yet. <laughs> like it can do more than we think. Urbosa's like, yeah, I heard it can make, like take real to life photos or images, right? Because ain't nobody heard of a digital camera. This is like Renaissance era stuff. Like yeah, the nar. It's like a, it's like seriously modern tech, bro. So um so this is where Mifa's request from her diary comes in. Because she requests to have a picture taken with all of the champions. And Zelda's like, yeah, we could totally do that. And I'm pretty sure they have um what's her what's her name from the the tech lab the hiteno tech lab pura mm -hmm. i think they have her take the picture <laughs> but um but yeah they're all they're all together and um so this is uh you know the first thing that she was super that mifa was super grateful for in her journal entry on page seven was was that um zelda agreed to the request and then the second thing that she is grateful for is that daruk brought them closer together uh and so this is like where the picture comes into play where uh you know pure has some notes for the group she asks daruna to crouch down because he's as tall as death mountain she hmm. asks zelda why she's so glum and tells her to smile um she tells rivali to get his tail closer to the group because of course he's standing off to the side being rivali uh and then she, <laughs> interestingly enough she has no notes for her boss or link <laughs> apparently they were fine and great just where they were photogenic I thought, I thought that was funny her is um, very photogenic yeah and she's like the end result super serious at first yeah like she's looking like tough like like you'd expect her to be because you know she's like warrior princess right um but then daruk does this thing right where he grabs the whole group and shoves them all together and of course like Zelda, Link, and Mifa are all standing side by side, so the three of them just get like totally smushed into to like space. You skip my favorite part. 
What's that? So like Mif is standing very far off to the side of Link. Oh like yeah, how, how Rivali was. And oh, the one note that I forgot to mention. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and she she's like Mifa, can you get closer to Link? And then you see her kind of like she's got her arms like this, and she like looks over at Link, and she like looks down, and she's like. And she just like does this like little penguin scoot. She does a little shuffle, yeah. Tries to like get closer, but then like she still is standing like a couple feet away from him when she like stops and she's like looks over and it's like. Hmm. I think <laughs> um, interestingly, I, I don't think Pura actually tells her to get closer, but she does ask her why she looks so nervous. She's like Mifa, you look so tense. Oh yeah, deep breaths, take some okay? deep breath. And then so then Mifa's like, yeah, I'll take some deep breaths. And then she like puts her hands on her chest and is like trying to like calm herself down as she's like scooting closer to Link. And then Daruk like, you know, shoves them all together. Hmm. Um, so in the end result of this, which I find hilarious, uh, Daruk's got this big mischievous grin. Like he knows what he's doing. He's like, I'm totally pranking this whole group right now. Uh, Urbosa is amused by this. Like she didn't even move. Like she didn't get shoved at all by this by this move from Daruk, and she suddenly has like this smirk on her face that she did not have before. <laughs> like, like she's she like, thinks this is hilarious, and also she's unaffected <laughs> entirely. She's like in the picture, aside from Daruk, who's like big smile in the back. Yeah, she's the only one still photogenic, like looking like you know she was ready for the. She's like. Everyone else was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, being smashed it, together by Daruk. Yeah. Link, Zelda and Mifo all look surprised, uncomfortable. They're all like, oh, what happened? Ravali looks Ravali, like he's throwing Ravali, up. Ravali looks <laughs> mad. Ravali looks like he's completely ticked off by this move. I don't know. To me, he looks like he's like ready to like throw up. He lo- He's like. <laughs> yeah, his his mouth is wide open. I, I feel like I see anger in his eyes. Like, how could you do this? <laughs> I didn't think that's just how you perceive him. Well, maybe. <laughs> but I think it's funny either way. Um, But yeah, so uh, Cass actually has this picture when you get back out of this cutscene, and he gifts it to Link. And it goes into your inventory. I'm pretty sure you can click on it and look at it whenever you want now. So there you go. One more reward for this DLC. Um, And so, yeah, it, it plays right back into Mifa's story the most somehow. Like everybody talked about the inauguration in their notes. Um, But none of them as cryptic or as like play by play as Mifa's where she was like, like here, here's my side of the story. We took this picture. Daruk shoved me right into Link. It was great. <laughs> like some nonsense. Come I think. On. I think this YouTube comment I read it was the top YouTube comment for that video. Uh, it kind of explains it all. It said the way that Mifa scooted closer to Link in the picture gives me the life to keep going. <laughs> okay. Uh- it's it's adorbs. The relationship mm-hmm. is adorbs. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, guys, we made it. That's the that's the end. That's the end of the DLC. <laughs> Good. Oh my goodness, that's a lot. I feel like I did a lot of talking there, but I was trying to get us through it. <laughs> trying to trying try to carry this podcast on my back through the trenches. <laughs> Now we got a motorcycle. And now we have a motorcycle. And and not much left to do with that motorcycle. True. But we have no. it. It's time to slay the pig, man. Put some skid marks on Gain's face before we kill him. <laughs> Everything okay there? Giggles? Yeah, it was just, just slow hissing, laughing of Cameron's comment. Gotcha. Cool, cool. Are you guys cool if I wrap this guy up, or you got any other comments about this DLC that you'd like to share? I mean, I'll put a bow on it. Get it wrapped up. Yeah, I'm good. Send it out. All right, cool, cool. 
All right. Well, this has been our episode of A for No, B for Yes. Uh, We have finally finished up the DLC, the Champions Ballad. Next episode, we will be completing the game. So be on the lookout for that two weeks from uh, whenever this releases, probably. Uh, And then we will uh, be moving on towards our next season. So the next episode after that will be our in-between. But for now... We are finishing up this season. So, y'all, if you want to reach out to us, if you have any comments, do you have any thoughts on who your favorite champion is, uh, who your favorite story from the hero song is, uh, or from the champion's ballad is, go ahead and uh, reach out to us at our, you know, off our website or at our, you know, Gmail, our Twitter, our Instagram, any of those places. Uh, I am active on all of those platforms. So, yeah, just let me know. Um, But, y'all... I'll catch you next time on the next episode. Until then, this has been A for No, B for Yes. Ravali's the best champion. Ravali is not the best champion. <sighs> Igor, why do you tell untruths? Did you get all that? But uh, we're not no, here to talk tiger. about Siegfried and Roy. Uh, we're here to talk about Zelda. You guys ready to talk about Sigmund Freud? Wait, Zelda. Anthony, no, not Link, are you though. here with us? Not Link at all. Just Zelda. Now Link has nothing to do with this man. Yeah, it's, not, nah. it's not his legend. No, nah, it's not. He's not even involved. He's sitting at home playing video games. <laughs> the Legend of Zelda series is. A 30-year example of copy my homework. Zelda gets all the credit. (laughs) Every game. Link did all the work. Zelda's like, oh, wow, Link, you must have gone to give me that trophy. (laughs) Okay, I get the Triforce. (laughs) People are going to walk around with, you're on everyone's shirt, but everybody that's over the age of 40 is going to call you Zelda anyways because they don't know and they don't care. Just like how PlayStations and Xboxes are Nintendos. I mean, <laughs> not anymore. That's kind of a dated joke, but you know. <laughs> y- yeah. My parents used to call everything a PlayStation. <laughs> oh, really? That's that's unusual. Usually yeah. all the parents call everything Nintendos. I think I think the, the going thing is to just pick one <laughs> and, and only remember the name of that one. But they never run with Xbox. All game systems were always just the one thing. I think it's because Xbox came a little bit later. It wasn't as popular, too. It wasn't as, like, uh, mainstream until 360. Yeah. The Xbox had a rough start, if you guys remember. Mm-hmm. I don't. Because I, I like, didn't it almost... know it existed. <laughs> yeah. If it wasn't for the 360 and Halo 3, just and those maybe two. Gears. I was going to say, I remember the first Halo being pretty big. Maybe not like as big, but big enough to know. Like there was a yeah, reason was... Halo 3 was big, and it's because Halo was actually good <laughs> in the first place. It was good, but it wasn't like phenomenal. Halo 3 was the, the masterpiece. Halo they 3 had everything was everything ever we ever needed for a sleepover. Yeah. It's like you want to build maps, you go build maps. You want to do multiplayer, go build multiplayer. You want to, you want to race, go race. You want to <laughs> I, got, just... I got two words for you: gravity, hammer. <laughs> We're gonna put them together. It's all gravity, you hammer, and energy sword duels all night, baby. Crank that speed up to three hundred percent and just charge each other. <laughs> energy and sword. That's the other one. Gravity, hammer, jousting. 
Oh no. Jeez. Oh, I just remember Action Matt. <laughs> yes, I actually brought up Action Matt yesterday when I was talking to Matt. <laughs> Action Matt was fantastic. Or no, yeah, we were frisbee golfing. I'm like Action Matt. <laughs> you got a kick out of that. The <laughs> legend of Action Matt, man. My dude would come rolling down the warthog. Uh, still bouncing. Jump, like just straight up Halo he jump out of his come warthog, in, like... get one kill just by crashing his warthog onto somebody. And then while he was still in the air, he would rocket launch another dude. <laughs> and he would land <laughs> and stab a third dude. <laughs> and he'd be like, where did you come from? He's like, I just remember the warthog would land behind him and he'd get back into it and keep driving. <laughs> I just remember like when when that was all going on we were on the desert map and there was some junk like in the middle of the map and i was on the lower end and i don't know where everyone else was but like i'm just like looking up because like something popped up on the radar and i just see matt and his warthog just like fly (laughs) off the junk pile and i'm just looking up like it's the lion king and the sun's rising and i'm like like it was slow motion and like heavenly music is and i just see matt like shoot a rocket launcher off and i'm like (laughs) how is this kid so cool action man oh gosh too cool for school he was really good in his war dog all right i just finished bouncing audio so i am good to record